Well, amen, amen. Can we praise God for all he did at VBS? Uh, what a time, what a week. Uh, hey, if you see our preschool team or our kids team, make sure to thank them and give them a big uh, hug because they put in a ton of work, and it was an unbelievable time, unbelievable week. Hey, I'm going to speak real quickly um, to everybody, but more specifically to the parents and to the adults in the room. And what I want to do this morning is ask us four questions. Uh, you know, this week we had a castle on stage. We were talking about kingdoms, talking about uh, a king. And today, that's what I want to touch real briefly on. If you've got a Bible, flip open to, to Luke chapter 16. And we'll start in verse uh, 19. So Luke chapter 16, flip open to there. We'll be in verse 19. And what we're going to find is two uh, men who, who lived for two different kingdoms and served a different king, and two different things happened to them, and they both pass away in this story, and then we get to hear the conversation that happens in this. So Luke chapter 16, verse 19, it says this. There was a rich man who would dress in purple and fine linen, feasting lavishly every day. Now, I've ate good before in my life, but I don't know if I've ever feasted lavishly. I mean, I want to try that out. That sounds pretty nice. Feasting lavishly every day. But a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, was lying at his gate. He longed to be filled with what fell from the rich man's table. But instead, the dogs would come and lick his sores. One day, the poor man died and was carried away by the angels of Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he looked up and saw Abraham a long way off with Lazarus at his side. Father Abraham, he called out, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this flame. Son, Abraham said, remember that during your life you received your good things just as Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here while you are in agony. Besides all this, a great chasm has been fixed between us and you, so that those who want to pass over from here to you cannot, neither can those cross from uh, over to us. Father, he said, then I beg you to send him to my father's house, because I have five brothers, to warn them so that they won't also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, they should listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to him, they will repent. But he told him, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. So you have this moment where there's this rich man, and he dresses in fine clothes, and he feasts lavishly every day. And you have a poor man named Lazarus who just lays at his gate. The dogs lick his sores. They both pass away. One enters into heaven. The other enters into hell. Now I want to clarify, the rich man doesn't go to hell because he's rich and wealthy. The rich man didn't have a relationship with God. And if we really look at this story, we can kind of tell pretty quickly, hey, this guy's probably more about him than he is anybody else. He's feasting lavishly every day while someone's laying at his gate just longing for what falls from his table, and he doesn't care to share with him. He doesn't care to help him. And so this man is pretty much, we can kind of tell, he, he doesn't have a relationship with God. He's all about living for his self, his name, his fame. And then we have Lazarus, who's a poor man. He, he passes away, heaven, hell, and then we have a conversation, and the rich man saying, hey, j just have him dip his finger in some water to cool my tongue because I'm in agony. Just send, uh, me, let, let someone go warn my brothers so that they won't also come to this place. Now, four questions I want to ask you this morning, specifically number one, is what kingdom are you building? What kingdom are you building? We can see pretty quickly that this rich man, as I was saying, he was all about his kingdom. He was all about his name. He was all about his fame. He was all about his wealth. He was all about the kingdom of him and, nobody, and nothing else. You know, we have this castle on stage. And castles, you know, are great. We love to, to, to look back and think about castles. And even this week, I Googled some castles. And, you know, at one time, castles were a sign of strength. They were a sign of a stronghold. I bet if we rolled up like to Camelot or wherever they had castles, right? Well, we'd roll up and if we saw the castle in its prime, we would say, oh my goodness, look at that castle. Look at how strong and mighty that is. And look at how, man, it's a sign of strong uh, place. It, man, it looks good and it's all taken care of. But a lot of castles that were built in the old days, if you Google them now, you know what they are? Ruins. They're old. They're worn down. They're broken down. And friends, let me just remind us today that everything that we once think is nice and shiny in this world, it will one day grow old. It will one day become ruins. It will one day wear out. One day along the way, everybody's going to take your belongings. They're going to pass them down from generation to generation. Someone's going to shove them in the attic, and then finally someone's going to take it all to Goodwill, and then no one's going to buy it at Goodwill, and then they're going to take it and throw it in the dumpster. 
I know some of you are like, not my favorite trophy, not my favorite outfit. It will one day. And, and, and for all of us, all of the things of this world will one day fade away. Even more than that, you can't take anything with you into the next life from this life. And so I just want to remind us that everything we live for, if we're all about building our own kingdom, building our own name, building our own fame, building our own wealth, then one day it's going to fade away, it's going to grow old, it's going to ruin, and even more, we're not going to take it with us. And isn't it interesting, too, in this story, it just says, the rich man. But the poor man named Lazarus' name is mentioned. Now, I don't know, but isn't this interesting? Because in this time of day, the rich man, everybody would have known his name. Everybody would have known the rich man's name. Everybody would have, would have wanted to know him. Everybody would have, would have known what his name was. And nobody would have known what Lazarus' name was. In fact, people probably never gave Lazarus the time of day when, uh, when so many people probably should have just stopped and said, Hey, how are you? How can we help you? What's your name? And, and I just want to ask us this morning, would you rather your name be known by the world or would you, or would you rather your name be known by Jesus? Like, would we rather our name be known by the whole entire world or would we rather our name be known by Jesus? And could it be that Lazarus' name is mentioned because Lazarus' name was in the book of life and he had a relationship with God and they knew who he was? Number two this morning is what kingdom will you enter? What kingdom will you enter? They both pass away. And the scripture's clear. They both enter into two separate places. Now, I know we don't always like to talk about this. I know we don't always like to get into this. Every single one of us, at one point or another, we will breathe our last breath and then we will stand judgment before God, and then we will enter a real place. We will either enter a real place called heaven or a real place called hell. We don't like to dive into that. I, I even, you know, it's Shark Week. Anybody know it's Shark Week right now? I, I was watching yesterday, and I was reading about Shark Week, and all of a sudden something popped up on an article, and it said uh, instead of calling them shark attacks, we want to call them shark interactions now. I'm like, oh, my word. Are you kidding me? It's a, it's a shark attack, right? And I'm saying this, we don't always like to talk about this stuff. But the truth is, all of us will stand before God one day and we'll be judged. And he'll either say, well done, my good and faithful servant, or depart from me for I never knew you. And then we'll either enter into heaven or we'll enter into hell. Now listen to me, you don't accept Jesus in your life and you don't get saved for fire insurance so you don't go to hell. And if that's the reason you do it, then you probably didn't mean it and you're not saved. That, that's a benefit, that's a plus, that's a great addition to it. It is, it is a big part of it. But you accept Jesus in your life, and we're going to talk about it here in a moment, because you realize Jesus loves me, Jesus died on the cross for me, Jesus took my place when I couldn't do what he did for me. He did something that I could never do. I need him in my life to cleanse me of my sin, and I need Jesus in my life in this life and the next life. But let me ask you this next question too. Because when we go along those lines, just write this down and I'll explain it. What have I done or well done? What have I done or well done? See, for all of us, when that moment happens, we'll either think, what have I done? Or we'll hear the words, well done. Look at verses 27 and 28. I want to show you something. Father, he said, then I beg you to send him to my father's house because I have five brothers to warn them. So they won't also come to this place of torment. I want you to notice something in this morning, in, in, in this moment. Look at the rich man. Look at how in this moment he's full of regret. And in this moment he's saying, what have I done? He's saying, just, just let someone warn my brothers. I don't want them to come to the same place that I've come to. And you could only imagine the sense of regret in his life saying, everything I lived for was wrong. Everything I stood for was wrong. Everything I chased after was the wrong thing. Everything I put value and priority on was the wrong thing. And in this moment, he's realizing, I missed it. And he's realizing everybody in his life, he pointed to the wrong direction. Let me ask you this morning, do you point people in the right direction towards Jesus or do you point people in the wrong direction? What will you think one day? Will you be full of regret like this man to think, what have I done? Man, everything I thought was important really was meaningless. Everything I valued really didn't matter. Everything I chased after was really nothing. Or will you be full of satisfaction? Because you realize, man, it was all about Jesus. And nothing else mattered. 
number four this morning this question if you answer this question right you'll answer the other three questions see when it comes to a kingdom it ultimately matters number four who is the king of your heart who is the king of your heart if, if you've got the right answer to that question and the answer if you have the answer is Jesus as the king of your heart then you'll build the right kingdom you'll be building the right kingdom you won't be building the kingdom of your name or your wealth or your fame you'll be building the kingdom of God that lasts and goes on forever and ever if you have the right answer as Jesus as the king of your heart, then one day you'll hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant, and you'll enter into heaven. If you have the answer as Jesus is the king of my heart, then you'll spend forever eternity in heaven forever where there's no more pain and no more sickness and no more darkness and no more evil forever. But then we have to ask the question, why is Jesus king? Why does he get to have the place of king as the rightful king? Friends, let me just remind you, in Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth. And then he created Adam and Eve. And then remember in Genesis chapter 3, the serpent tempts Adam and Eve and they eat of the apple. And in that moment, sin enters into the world. And you and I have a sinful nature. You don't believe me? Well, did anybody have to teach you how to be selfish? Nope. Did anybody have to teach you how to be prideful? Nope. Did anybody have to teach you how to lose your temper? Nope. I, I mean, all of us have a sinful nature. And because of that sinful nature in the Old Testament, they began to sacrifice animals all pointing forward to the New Testament when the great sacrifice would come, who was Jesus. And then in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you read about a guy named Jesus who comes onto the scene, born of a virgin Mary, fully God and fully human. You say, why does that matter? He's fully God, but he's also fully human. Because he's fully human, he can feel what you and I feel. He can experience what you and I experience. He, he, he can be tempted like you and I are tempted. He got tired. That's why you read about him taking naps. He faced uh, pain and persecution. That's why you read about him in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's sweating blood before he goes to the cross. He, he was tempted like you and I, but here's the difference between Jesus and you and I. He did what we couldn't do. He never sinned, not even once. He lived a perfect, sinless life. And then at 33 years old, he was taken. Not because he couldn't handle them, but because he willfully said, I will be taken. Because I know that I'm supposed to die because I'm going to die for you and all of us. And I'm going to take your place and do what you can't do. And, and, and in that moment, picture it with me. They take Jesus and they beat him. And they begin to mock him and they begin to ridicule him. They begin to make fun of him. They took a crown of thorns and they place it on his head. And you can imagine as the blood begins to stream down. And then they take him out and he has to carry his own cross and he can't even carry it the whole way there. Someone else has to help. And then they take his arms and they put a nail through and they put a nail through the other arm and then they take his feet and they put a nail through. And as he's hanging on that cross, they're still mocking him. They're still ridiculing him. They, they even put a sign over this. says, hell, king of the Jews, to make fun of him. And Jesus hung on that cross bloody until he yelled out, it is finished. And then three days later Jesus got up from the grave and when Jesus got up from that grave he made a statement he made a statement loud and clear and here's what it was I am king over all I'm king over the darkness I'm king over your sin I'm king over any temptation I'm king over any pain I'm king over any persecution no one is higher no one is greater no one's done what I've been able to do I am king over all and he made that statement to say hey I've done what nobody else can do and you know what's so radical about that every king you read about they love their throne so much and everybody serves them. But King Jesus said, hey, instead of you serving me, I'm going to leave my throne and I'm going to come down to you. And think about it. He came down to us. And after he rose from the dead, he hung out with his disciples a few more days. And then he ascended back into heaven. And right now he's on the throne. And he looks at us and he says, hey, I'm king. And if you choose to let me in your life, I'll be king over your life. I'll be king over your heart. If you just let me in, I'll come in. I'll change you. I'll save you. I'll be Lord over all in your life. But you've got to decide. You've got to choose. Is he king of your heart? Have you ever truly surrendered everything to Jesus? 
want to show you this last picture here in just a moment. Last week I was at Long Hollow preaching. And they called me on Saturday at noon and they said, hey, one of our lead team members is in the hospital. They had found him on Friday unresponsive. He had gone to walk his dog to the mailbox and somewhere along that walk he collapsed. So he called me on Saturday at noon and so I began to change my message. I preached there Sunday. They were praying for a miracle. They were praying um, for him to be healed. And unfortunately this week he, he passed away. Be praying for them. I told Pastor Robbie this morning I was praying for him as he was preaching to the church. Chris Swain passed away. He was 47 years old with a 13-year-old and a 10-year-old and a wife. And I want to show you this post that his wife put up on social media. It says, from Chris's wife, Chris is in the arms of Jesus. He has been welcomed as a good and faithful servant and no doubt is already making himself at home. I want to ask you this morning, what would we say about you? Would we say that you're already in the arms of Jesus? Would we say that you've been welcomed as a good and faithful servant? Would we say that you're already home? Do you know? Is he king of your life? If you would, just bow your head and close your eyes. With nobody looking around and nobody moving. This morning, if you say, Sam, to be honest, I just don't know if he's king of my heart. I I don't know what he would say if I stood before him when I stand at judgment. I don't know if he'd say, well done, or if he'd say, depart from me for I never knew you. I don't know if I'd be in the arms of Jesus. And this morning, if you say, Sam, I don't know. But this morning, I want to know. And I want to make Jesus king of my heart them with no one looking around, no one moving. Would you just pray this prayer right where you're at? Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I believe that you died on the cross. I believe that you rose again three days later. Come in my life. Change me. Save me. I promise to never, ever be the same again. With nobody looking around, nobody moving. If you just prayed that prayer, would you just raise up your hand? Just raise it up right now. Just raise it up. I see you. Just raise it up. Just raise it up. Just raise it up. Put it back down. Maybe today some of you say, Sam, to be honest, Jesus is king of my life. But I've let some things take the place of Jesus as king of my heart. And I just need to come down. I need to pray with some people today. I need to come to the altar. And there may be others of you today say, Sam, to be honest, I know Jesus is king of my heart, but I've never been baptized after salvation. And I need to talk to someone to schedule that and make that happen. Here in just a moment, if any of those things, if you rose your hand, if you say, I need to lay down some things, I need some prayer, hey, I need to talk about baptism, we're going to have some people down front And there's a battle that's going to go on in your heart and mind. It's going to be, do I get up from this chair and do I walk down? Or do I stay seated? And let me just tell you this morning, serve the king and follow what the king of your heart's telling you to do. Come on down and talk to someone. Let someone pray with you. Tell them the decision you made. Tell them the prayer that you prayed. And just talk with them. Lord Jesus, we pray in this room that you would move. God, I pray that if people need to come down, they would come down. And as I'm praying, our prayer partners will just go ahead and come down. Lord Jesus, would we come to you today? God, you came to us. Would we be willing to come to you? Holy Spirit, we we, we pray that you would move and do what only you can do. And in Jesus' name I pray. We're going to stand right where we're at, and we're going to worship for a minute. And so go ahead and stand right where you're at. And then if you said, hey, I need to come down, just come on down. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Don't delay. You move as God prompts you to move. Just come on down and grab somebody.